class, our Sunday school class in here, and um, just kind of what we'd like to do in coming weeks. And um, I had been um, just kind of exchanging a couple of books and things with him just kind of as ideas. And uh, there was a a very good book um, by an author named uh, Jim Berg, uh, and it's published by Bob Jones. And uh, it's just a tremendous book about discipleship. um, And uh, it's Change Into His Image is the name of the book. And what uh, Brother Berg has done is come up with kind of a whole study series uh, through the, the principles in the book. And they're all, it's, it's not to just the book, it's out of the Bible. But he just draws lessons out of that that are similar to what we would consider to be discipleship type of lessons. Um, not just basic how to be saved, what does baptism mean, those kinds of things. It gr- goes beyond that to uh, what does living for Christ look like in my daily life? And uh, how, how can I be changed into the image, not of me, or even, I, sometimes I think the things that Christians like you and I struggle with is, I don't want to be changed into the image of the best Christian that I know. I'm supposed to be changed in the image of Jesus Christ. And so what Brother Berg does in the book is kind of take you through what the Bible says about how can you and I be more like the Lord Jesus Christ? What is that going to look like? What are the practical steps needed to get there? And so uh, we had just in the last uh, two or three weeks, we've been talking about that and really kind of praying and asking the Lord if he'd have us to go through that. And I think that he would. And so we're going to start that here in the next uh, week or so. And that will include uh, giving you just a workbook and and we'll kind of go through those things. And what it is, is kind of helping you throughout the week also to go through and have some some personal Bible study and and, uh, in your time of devotions, going through uh, the principles that are are found and talked about uh, from week by week. But he and I are going to um, kind of teach that together and uh, take different lessons. And, and uh, so we're going to kind of tag team, if you will, in this class. Um, but um, as I say that, I'm, I wanted to give this lesson today and just kind of as a jumping off point to, boy, my perspective needs to change about uh, what I think about God and, and how I go about my daily living. And what does it mean, not just for me today, but uh, again, as we, we kind of have as a common theme is, what do my decisions mean generationally? Um, what do the things that I'm doing now, what is that going to mean for generations to come? What, what am I teaching those to come? And so take your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter number 4, if you will, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. 1 Samuel 4 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army of the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Now listen to the, the question, or listen to their response, why they, or their solution to this problem of defeat. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Now, I hope you saw there's a problem with the pronouns in verse number three, all right? Instead of referring to the it, all right, as like it's some kind of magic lamp, so to speak, it should have been a personal pronoun. We should have been referencing God the Heavenly Father rather than just the ark, all right? And the problem, again, was their perspective was off. The, the way that they viewed things was skewed And it caused destruction in the nation. It caused families to lose daddies and sons because we chose to put the emphasis on the wrong thing. All right, so let's pray. We'll get into lesson this morning. Lord, we've prayed already a few times today, and we we pray that uh, today, once again, you'd help us understand what's being said. We don't just want to pray to, to just fill time. Lord, we, we, we sincerely come as people in need of hearing from your word because we need to make better decisions. We need to have our perspective in the right place and realize that it's very easy that it can get, get, get skewed. And Lord, just over time, as it's continually skewed, 
It, we just get farther and farther and farther away from the truth. Help us, please, to understand that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So at the end of the book of Judges, we really get that sense of the spiritual um, nature of the people, if you will. And again, we've, we've referenced this phrase several times, especially on Wednesday nights as we've been going through the Old Testament. But the end of the book of Judges, and if you want, you can turn back to the end of the book of Judges. I'll just quote what it says there. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. And because there's no king, either capital K or lowercase k, because there's no king in Israel, then the Bible says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So if I think this is right, then that's what I'm going to do for my family. If, if this is what I determine is correct for us or for my living, then that's what I'm going to do. And if we looked at our society today, that's what most people do. This is what's right for me. This is what I think I ought to do. This is what is best for me. And how dare you tell me that this is wrong? What's right for you is right for you. What's right for me is right for me. And so we have this, this truth that's not uh, uh, foundational or not uh, founded in God's Word. It becomes really um, whatever my rationalization of truth becomes. Right? And that's not truth at all. And that's what had been going on here in the nation of Israel. You remember Judges, that cycle of, boy, we're, we're pleasing the Lord and we're, we're getting along, we're in relationship with the Lord, and then we slack off and we, we, we fall into sin. And, and because sin comes, then judgment comes. There's consequence for my sin. And then when judgment comes, God's people decide, well, maybe I went wrong when I started sinning. Yeah, a novel idea. And so we return back to the Lord and we repent and we ask for His help and God delivers a judge and the judge delivers God's people once again. And God's people get right with the Lord for a certain time and it's just this constant cycle. By the way, I think we fall into some of that in church life. And so we would schedule things like revivals and, and as, as much as I dislike the phrase, we schedule revival because I don't think you really schedule revival. We try to schedule meetings and, and, and put some emphasis on preaching because what's going to help you in your life, what's going to help me is this book, to be quite honest. And so we, we set aside some certain times during the year to, to spend time in this book and to hear preaching from this book and, and to allow the Lord to do the work in and, in and of our hearts. If I don't allow God to work in my heart, then I am honestly a miserable person. And I'm going to find myself doing wrong things and making wrong decisions and, and, uh, and uh, I'm not going to see things clearly like I should. I'm not going to have the discernment God wants me to have. Well, the judge at this time in the nation of Israel, as we're kind of making our way out of the book of Judges, uh, is the man named Eli, and he's serving also as the high priest. And Eli has been at his post really for, for some time. He's, he's serving in, in kind of a dual capacity. He'd been in this post for about 40 years, in fact, during the time of the Philistine um, kind of reign, if you want to say that, over those nations of Israel. They just constantly seemed like the Philistines were the thorn in the flesh of the armies of Israel. And by the time 1 Samuel begins, Eli is old. The Bible explains to us in the first part of 1 Samuel that he's losing his sight. And I think we could make the, the connection that it wasn't just physical sight that Eli was losing. It wasn't just that he's becoming blind in his eyes. He was losing spiritual sight. He wasn't spending time doing what the Lord wanted him to do. In fact, he's raising two sons. And the Bible says that uh, his two sons were wicked before the Lord. They were sons of Belial. And Eli, the high priest, the judge of Israel, was doing nothing to correct his sons. And it's just a, a tragedy. And so you see the children of Israel are under this oppression because, well, I take my sacrifice to the, the, the men who are supposed to be acting as, as part of the high priest, and they're the sons of uh, Hophni and Phinehas of, of Eli, and they're taking parts for themselves that they had no business taking. They're taking God's portion. They're taking the best part of the sacrifice. And Eli is just allowing this to go on and go on and go on. And so is it any wonder that there's repercussions for that in the nation? No, it's exactly why there's problems. It's exactly why God has, has not necessarily removed his hand, but he's allowing this judgment to take place. So this relationship between Eli and God is nowhere near where it should have been. In fact, uh, look back, uh, just go left a little bit. Look at chapter 1 for Samuel. Look at verse 9. This is the story, of course, of Hannah 
coming to pray. And you remember what Eli thinks that she's doing? It's been so long, really, since anybody came to pray that Eli thinks she's drunk. Hannah rose up, verse 9, after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now, Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore... Eli thought she had been drunken, and Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thine, thy wine from thee. You see, Eli hadn't spent time necessarily in prayer a whole lot, and so when somebody else comes to pray, he doesn't even recognize that's what it is. Look at chapter number 2. Look at the description again of these sons. Look at verse number 12 of chapter number 2. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came. Now question, who's the priest's servant? Hophni and Phinehas. What did the verse just previous to this say? They knew not the Lord. So we have unsaved people offering even the sacrifice to God. While the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of, of three teeth in his hand, he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, or boiled, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let not... Uh, let them not fail to burn the fat presently and then take as much as thy soul desireth. Then he would answer him, nay. So in other words, the Israelite person knows it's not right and they're trying to correct the, the servant of the, the priest and the priest is saying, no, this is what we're going to do, or the, the servant of the priest. But thou shalt give it me now. And if not, look at this. I will take it by force. If you don't give it to me, I'm just going to take it anyway. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. For men, now listen to this, men abhorred the offering of the Lord. <clears throat> so you bring a sacrifice and you're trying to offer it to your God. And it got to the point, it was so bad, these two men, under the leadership of Eli, their father, that men hated doing it. They hated coming to church. They hated everything about it. Because it wasn't honoring to the Lord at all. That's what's going on. Look at verse 22. Eli was very old, heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Wickedness. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Look at verse 27. There came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire the son of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in mine habitation? And honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thy house. 
Thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, and all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thy house forever. And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes, and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. Wow. Wow. A scathing rebuke by this unknown man who comes in and gives this message from the Lord. And so this, this lack of relationship in Eli's life transfers itself to a lack of relationship in the life of his two, two sons and then on into the nation of Israel. And the lack of relationship caused Eli and it causes us as well to not be able to discern that in the first part of 1 Samuel, God's presence has been removed from the nation of Israel. He's not fighting their battles for them. He's not helping them as he had done in times past. Now, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read you Judges 16, just a little bit to the left. Judges 16 and verse number 18. I want you to listen to what the Bible says. Judges 16, verse number 18. And when Delilah saw that he had uh, told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, come up, at, uh, come up at once, for he has shown me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand, and she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, now here's the the emphasis, here's the correlation. I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And listen, and he wist or he knew not that the Lord was departed from him. Why? Because there wasn't a relationship as there should have been. And it's the same thing going on in 1 Samuel chapter number 1, 2, 3, and 4. The relationship with the Lord isn't there. In fact, Eli is so poor in his relationship that he hasn't even taught his sons how to trust in God. And they knew not the Lord. So how do we we foster this relationship? How do I make sure that my relationship doesn't turn into what it did in Eli's life or in in Hophni and Phinehas' life? Well, number one, I think our passage here is going to help us understand that I have to emphasize, first and foremost, I have to emphasize the presence of God in my life. Now, Chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, in the first four verses here, what happened? Israel just assumed that if we bring the Ark of the Covenant in, then God's presence will be with us. All right, so they just assumed God's presence. And I get the sense as I read verse number 3 that Israel is surprised that they're defeated by the Israelite army. When the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? We don't understand why this is going on. They had so far gotten away from God that they can't even understand that there's, there's repercussions for the wrong way that they're going. And I can't help but think of, of uh, Joshua leading the nation of Israel into Jericho and God's presence being with them. And then all of a sudden, we're got, we got too big for our britches and we forgot God. Well, God's just going to go with us as He did before. And then we march up to little old Ai and we get soundly defeated. Because we didn't go with God's presence. We didn't go with God's wisdom, with God's direction. And rather than the Israelites chasing the Philistines, they're being chased because of the absence of God in the lives of the Israelites. So what happens? Well, in Jericho and in Ai, you remember there's a man that uh, causes a little bit of difficulty, and his name is Achan. And he's taken of the accursed thing. God said, all of the gold and all of the the, the treasure is going to be mine. God will provide for the Israelites, but the first thing, the first fruits are God's. Well, because Achan lacked relationship with God, he didn't care enough about what God had said, and so he didn't realize that it's just between me and my God. It's not just my nation. It's not my, my grandfather or my grandmother. It's not my mom or my dad. It's me, my relationship with God. And so because he doesn't have the relationship, Achan, he takes of the accursed thing, and then he goes and hides it, and what happens? Well, God knows exactly where the accursed thing is. And he singles out 
Achan, and he singles out his family, and his family is killed because of his cho choice to sin. And it's just time after time throughout the Bible, we see the tragedy of choosing sin, choosing worldliness, choosing self over God. And so when my relationship with God isn't right, what happens to my spirit? Well, it becomes callous. And when God knocks on the door of my heart and says, son, you need to knock that off. You need to stop doing that. You need to start doing these things. My callous spirit doesn't feel the need to respond. My relationship is strained. I fail to see that God actually is, is now uh, away from me. And really the issue isn't because God has moved. The issue is I've moved away from Him. And it's a problem. And so the Israelites, verse 3, they assume God's presence. Secondly, they sought man's wisdom instead of God's wisdom. So notice what they do in verse number 3. Here's their, their, their wise counsel. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. And so they turn to the council, the, these elders, who were supposed to be the authority in the nation. And the elders became the de facto authority rather than Almighty God. Now, does that mean that we shouldn't respect the elders? No. But elders... You should have wisdom in your life, and it should come from your relationship with God. Because there are younger ones underneath you that are coming up that are going to need your help and your wisdom and your direction as well. Right? That's why the New Testament talks about the, the older teaching the younger. Specifically, it's about ladies. It also has the implication of men, the older teaching the younger. However, we get into 1 Samuel, and because the relationship has been so strained with God, and because we haven't spent time cultivating that, the elders became the, the, the authority rather than God, and because they, they didn't know what they should do, they just turned to some lucky charm. Well, we've heard of God working through this in the past. So because God worked through this in the past, we're going to just bring this ark in, and we believe that this will be the, the magic token. Now, they don't say that with their mouth, but that's exactly what they're doing. And so they, they, they're seeking man's wisdom. Well, this seems to be the best that we can figure out. And the, the, the question that the elders state in verse number 13, or the, the, the surprise in verse number 3, rather, of 1 Samuel chapter number 4, is not with themselves. Notice they, they're questioning God and His motive. Why, wherefore, hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? They didn't even realize they were the problem. You see how their perspective is, is so far gone. You know, I, I've found that to be true in, in pastoral ministry, is that people get away from God, and then they, they make unwise choices with their life. And you know who the first person they blame is? God. Well, God, you know, look at what all these things God is doing to me. And the issue is, no, it's consequences for your wrong actions. And God is, is bringing some things, or allowing some things in your life to come back to Him, not to blame Him. The problem is my wrong choices. Proverbs 19, verse number 3, The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. My foolishness is what gets me away from the Lord. They assume God's presence. They sought man's wisdom instead of God's. Third, they substituted a symbol of God and of His presence rather than the real thing. Look at verse number four. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims, and the two sons of Eli, oh no, Hophni and Phinehas were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So, question. Just think through. Can, can something created with human hands properly substitute for Almighty God? <laughs> Never. Not one time can that ever take place. All that it does, when, when I try to fashion something to become like God or to become a God in my life... You understand that all that I'm doing is I'm really discrediting who God is. I'm making God to be in the image that I think Him to be. 
And so anyone that, uh, you know, carves an idol in some other country, some other religion, you're discrediting Almighty God Himself. You're mocking the God of the universe when that takes place. Now, did God, God give directions for the ark? Yes. Yes. And it was made in the image that God wanted them to. However, the problem became when the trust went from God to the ark. And again, I'm making something made with hands to be in the image of God. And all that I'm doing is mocking Him. I'm discrediting Him and His power. And so Israel, they, they treat the Ark of the Covenant. The Philistines brought their, their god Dagon. All right? he, he looks kind of like a fish. And they made this statue of their god. And they brought him into battle with them, believing that this, this statue, this body of a man and head like a fish is going to bring them victory. I mean, can you, can you imagine? But in comparison, that's exactly what Israel is doing. They're watching the enemy bring in their God, and what they're doing is saying, well, we've got something that, you know, represents our God. And so maybe if we bring that into our camp, then, then our God will give us victory. And they look at this, this symbol as their relationship with God. And people do it in different ways. Sometimes, well, look, I'm wearing a cross. That means I'm a Christian. Well, look, I got a little fish on my car. I mean, I'm a Christian. Yeah, and you drive like a, a demon. You know, follow me to Trinity Baptist Church and you're cutting people off and running red lights and I hope you don't do that. <laughs> look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be a child of God. And then we act like the devil. It doesn't make sense. Hold your place. Look at Numbers chapter number 10. I know, we're running late. Numbers chapter number 10. Numbers 10 and verse number 35. See, this is what Israel heard about came to pass, Numbers 10, verse number 35, it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. Now, do you see the difference in emphasis with Moses? The issue with Moses, the emphasis there is God. Right? The, the Lord is the focus. By the way, the enemy is the enemies of the Lord. Not even their enemies. And so Moses prays, Lord, as this ark goes, then your presence, we understand your presence is going, and so rise up, Lord, and all your enemies will be scattered. And we won't turn, but Deuteronomy chapter number 12, they're, they're giving the, the, the place that, that, and God said, where, where I've chosen, that's the place where you come to. That's the place where you're going to come and worship to me. And for years, it, it had been in Shiloh. God moves that. It, it comes to Jerusalem. And so even today, you see Jews coming to Jerusalem to, to do their worship. The issue was, I don't choose where that place is. God chooses where that place is. But instead of honoring God in what they did, they really disgraced and again they dishonored God because the relationship wasn't right. They were satisfied with just a symbol of God's presence rather than the real thing. And they substituted this, this image, this, this thing, for God. And they were looking for what? Well, an outward display of power. I want God to fix my problem, but I don't want Him necessarily messing around with my heart. God, I want you to, to get me out of this mess that I'm in. But Lord, I mean, you know, don't go to making the preacher mad at me. Don't, don't, don't uh, you know, I, I know I got some things I need to change, but Lord, we're not talking about that right now. I have this problem. That's exactly what Israel's doing. Lord, fix my problem. Don't fix me. I'm not concerned about, enough about my relationship with you. I just want you to, to do what I want you to do. And it's such a, a tragic state of affairs in verse number 4. The people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, which dwelt between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Spiritual blindness. The blind leading the blind. 
Jesus said in the New Testament, it's here in the Old Testament. And we'll, we'll end right there. We didn't get to points two and three. Maybe we'll, we'll finish this next week. But the, the, the verse I want to leave you with is Proverbs 14, verse number 34. Many of you probably know it. At the very least, when you hear it, you'll understand what's being said. Proverbs 34 and verse number, Proverbs 14 rather, verse number 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation. And the second part is, but sin is a reproach to any people. And so if we side with God, if we choose to, to go in the way of righteousness, then God says, righteousness, that, that living right, living for God is what exalts the nation. But when you as a nation choose sin, it's going to be a reproach to you. And don't expect God to, to be there as the helping hand necessarily when you choose to go away from Him. See, God's not a genie that I just pick up and call any time that I want to. Right? Well, God, I made a mess, and so now I need you to fix it. Right? How about we have enough relationship with God that we don't get into the mess to begin with? Right? That's the issue. And so we'll finish this next week, but just ask yourself that question, Lord. Where is my relationship with you? Am, am I close enough with you that my perspective uh, has gotten skewed? That I, I started off here, but Lord, over time, my perspective has gotten skewed a long way. Just because I started here. So Lord, help me to take care of it when it gets here. To bring it, Lord, to where I'm right in line with you. Right? That's living righteously. That's, in fact, we're going to talk about it today in the, in, the, in the sermon this morning. What is it like to live righteously? And then, Lord, am I doing that personally? Not just as our church, not just as my grandma or grandpa, not just am I trying to do with my kids. Lord, how about me? What am I doing personally? All right, let's pray. Lord, please help us to ask ourselves that question. Would you please show us in our hearts what needs to be changed? Lord, help us. If there's something that, that needs to be taken out, then Lord, help us to make that choice. If it's something that needs to be added in, something we need to start doing, then Lord, please help us to do that as well. Help us not to substitute other things, church attendance, or even carrying around our Bible, or something as silly as a bumper sticker. And Lord, I don't think anybody necessarily is doing that, but we can substitute other things for you. Help us, please, to have your presence as a part of our lives every day, and we'll give honor and praise to you. We'll, we'll be very grateful. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed. We've got about 10, 15 minutes until our morning service begins. Glad that you're here this morning.